Hi guys, welcome to a new episode and today we're going to talk about depreciating licenses. And this is a very, very interesting topic because I think it can be applied in a lot of use cases in NFTs and other areas of tokenized ecosystems. So today we have with us Anthony Li Zhang. Hi Anthony, welcome. Hey Lisa, um, really great to be on here. Yeah. Thanks for joining us and thanks for writing this amazing paper. I love it. And you know, if I could tele teleport back to two years ago, I'll tell myself to watch out for this paper because this is exactly what I was looking for two years ago. Because property rights and tokenizing property rights as well as finding more efficient ways to be embedded within property rights for allocation or like efficient allocation is beautiful. And we can do that now. Great. So can you, before we start, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm um, Anthony Zhang. So I am a um, assistant professor of finance right now at the University of Chicago um, booth, right? So then um, I work on a variety of topics. So my work is kind of in financial market uh, intermediation and market design, right? So then I do, for example, I analyze questions about how we can analyze financial markets, figure out sort of how efficient they are, and then how we can make them work better, right? And then some of the sort of more classical markets I study are, for example, the banking industry, housing markets, derivative markets. Um, and then this is an earlier paper, actually, I worked on that I've recently revised, um, which I think we mainly were aiming this paper at sort of analyzing questions of natural resource license design. But sort of there seem to have been a bunch of applications to um, crypto topics as well. And so sort of... Um, Sort of now that the NFT somewhat recently, I think the paper predates the NFT boom, but sort of we realized when we were seeing all this uh, NFT um, action going on that sort of some of the ideas here might also be applicable to the NFT um, space. So that's kind of uh, sort of who I am and sort of where um, where I'm coming from on, on this. Yeah. Fantastic. So this, to this topic is about depreciating licenses. Do you want to give us a very quick intro to what the paper is talking about and what are depreciating licenses? Sure, great. So I think like to give an idea of what depreciating licenses are, here's kind of the trade-offs that they want to solve, right? Um, so the way we often motivate this is that the government has a bunch of natural resources, right? And then sort of the goal of what we want to do with these natural resources. So think of this as, for example, land to begin with, but also like radio spectrum, like oil drilling rights, say fishing rights, right? What are all these things, right? Sort of there are sort of sources of value. There's sources of things that sort of somebody can generate a lot of value from, from like fishing, from building radio towers and selling 5G spectrum, things like that, right? And sort of the government wants to kind of de decide who should get access to be able to use these resources and also sort of try and raise revenue from the use of these resources and sort of redistribute the revenue back to the people somehow, right? And the classic way to do this sort of since basically the Chicago free market revolution is privatization, right? And then so our privatization seems simple because the idea is basically sort of like prior to this privatization boom, the government is like, well, we'll just figure things out, right? We'll take these licenses and we'll say, you should be using Spectrum, right? Um, you're the best user, so we'll just give it to you. And then that doesn't work so well because basically, so the government is constrained in how much information it has about um, sort of who's the most efficient user. So this is a kind of Hayekian price discovery problem where kind of you don't have enough information to figure out who's the best user. So the government decided to start privatizing, right? And then they said like, well, it turns out if we believe the market is good at sort of deciding who the best user is, right? In the whole invisible hand sense, we can just like auction off this license and whoever is the highest bidder for the license is gonna be the best user of the asset, right? So then sort of that's what they started doing from like the nineties onwards. And then where we come is, is basically that privatization works like fairly well. But you can actually notice cases where privatization sort of generates distortions. One of the big distortions that privatization generates is holdout. Holdout basically means if you sell a spectrum license or a land use license, right? That all allocation is often efficient sort of when you first sell the license, right? But sort of 20 years later, sort of the same company is kind of stuck with the license, right? Much more efficient companies have come in and sort of they want the license. But the old company is basically like, hey, I have this. I know you're willing to pay a lot of money for it, right? And I'm just going to wait and try and ex extract the highest payment I can from you, right? So where we come in is basically pure privatization also doesn't work perfectly, right? And then sort of what we notice is basically that there is a way to do slightly better than privatization in terms of allocating these resources efficiently, right? If instead of selling these really long-term property rights, saying you as a TV station in 1990, get radio spectrum use and can use it forever, right? Um, 
suppose we sell five-year spectrum rights, right? Every five years, we can resell the spectrum rights to the highest value user, right? And then, then we would get like efficient allocation, right? Um, the issue there is basically that if you sell five-year spectrum use rights to TV um, broadcasters, for example, right? Um, they are not going to like that because they are only going to have access to spectrum for five years. You build out like radio stations, you sort of tune your equipment if you're a cell phone manufacturer to use the spectrum. And then five years later, um, this sort of, you may not have this spectrum, right? And then so sort of what I want to highlight, sorry for spending so long setting up the problem, but what I want to highlight is basically that sort of resource license design affects the efficiency of use of these resources, right? And the idea is that sort of pure privatization, selling really long-term use rights, it gives people this kind of security in their assets, right? It gives them incentives to like invest, build your radio tower, stuff like that. But it generates holdout problems because people own like inalienable rights and can hold on to these assets longer than they socially should. It's hard to reallocate them to new entrants, right? Whereas these so short-term license, oh, sorry, go on. So here we're talking about actually two different problems. One is whether you're holding it long enough for you to invest additional resources to build up the, the radio towers, to improve the, the, maximize the utility of the spectrum okay. that's yeah. awarded to you versus allocation efficiency or asset allocation where we can allocate it to the person with the highest value right now. So exactly. we're trying to yeah. figure out how to balance both of them because they're on opposite spectrums. Exactly. Like short-term asset allocation right now, which will end for short-term only, which you trade off in investment or you give long-term investment, but you can trade. You will trade off in asset allocation. Yes, exactly. Um, and sort of the idea is basically that sort of the old license designs face this trade-off, which is that long-term licenses um, give you high investment incentives, but aren't very good for allocation. And short-term licenses have the other problem. So sort of where we come in is sort of here's a trade-off. And then we propose a better way to navigate this trade-off, right? So we're proposing a license that neither that sort of behaves like a license that, so think of a long-term license as you own 100% of a resource forever, right? Think of a short-term license as you own 100% of the resource for like a couple of years, five years or so, right? We create a license that lasts forever, but basically depreciates. So it's like you own spectrum use rights for 100% one year, 90% the next year, 81% the next year, and so on and so forth. So we basically have property rights that sort of decay over time, right? And then the way in which this works is basically, um, every year, you can think of the government as printing new equity in the license, right? So basically, every year, the government, say, prints 10% more stock in the license. And the idea is that every year, if you want to use the, license, the resource, you have to buy, you have to own 100% of the stock. So then you, if you own the license last year, this year, you have to um, participate in an auction where you buy, either, either you can buy 10% of the license from the government, right? And then you can continue using the asset or you can sell your 90% to a buyer and leave, right? And you can see how this is kind of a partial property, right? Because if you own something this year, you own a fraction of it next year and a smaller fraction the next year and so on. What we show basically is if you take the limits, right? If you take the depreciation rate to 100%, the government is just printing 100% new equity every year, right? Then sort of this is basically a short-term license. It's literally a one period license. You own something today, you have no stake in it tomorrow. You set this depreciation rate very low and it's basically a perpetual license. Right. In the middle, sort of this behaves like something in between, right? And we show in this paper by setting up a sort of game theoretic model of this setup that sort of it trades off allocation and investment, right? Like if you have a depreciation rate that's like 20%, sort of owners have less incentive to hold out than they did under like sort of pure privatization. And the idea you can think of as sort of if you have to pay to keep using the resource, right? You have a lower incentive to hold out for really high prices because if you aren't willing to sell, you have to actually pay to buy that 20%, right? And then so that's basically the idea of a depreciating license. It's a sort of partial property rights mechanism, a sort of resource use license that smoothly decays over time. And it's kind of a continuous way to interpolate between your like really long-term license and really short-term licenses. Yeah. So it's kind of if I have if I had 100 percent of an equity, I have partially, I've owned partial partial of it, which is the long-term license. And the partial part is where the other half or the other remaining amount is going to be, I have to pay almost like a rental amount. Exactly, that is, yeah. They have to pay to, let's say, the government. Exactly. And yeah. for governments to do this, they will be issuing a new equity equivalent of this specific asset to yeah. dilute yeah. it. Exactly, okay. yeah.
I know that that part already has a lot of the paper. I have a lot of questions like worth discussing on the papers, but I just want to sidetrack a little bit. With the government printing additional equity, would that be something like quantitative easing by central bank printing more money, which leads to inflationary inflationary forces of the asset? Then it's not really fair pricing after all. Yeah, so that's a very great question. I think the difference between uh, depreciating license and quantitative easing is in QE, sort of the government sort of has discretion in how much money it wants to print, right? So there's this kind of uncertainty aspect, which is sort of the economy has to price in the possibility of QE, but sort of they don't know how much the government is going to commit to sort of printing money, right? And so the possibility of hyperinflation is basically sort of a loss of trust in the government as a control of the currency, right? So the way we're pitching depreciating licenses, sort of the government should commit upfront to a path of selling equity, right? And if it does that, then concerns about sort of dilution are sort of less salient because everyone knows that when you buy a license, that entitles you to 90% next year, 81% next year, and so on and so forth. Right. And sort of all it does is basically make it so that when you buy an asset, you're buying something which is sort of a decaying stake in the asset, sort of that's common knowledge and people can price it into the value they're willing to pay for the license. So in the paper, we have some models of showing how sort of you can calculate the effect of these sort of depreciation rates on prices and people will price in a lower price because of the fact that you know you're going to have to pay these fee payments in the future. Yeah. And when we are talking about partial owning partial ownership of the license that's it's not going to be possible if you own just partial ownership because you have to own 100% before you can actually use that so for example yes, you need exactly. to own yeah. 100% paying the fixed fee and paying the rental fee like yeah yeah and then you can use the entire spectrum yeah exactly right and the idea is basically that we don't want to be in a situation where sort of like take houses for example right yeah. sort of it's efficient for one person to own a house um, it's not good to have sort of fractions of sort of houses traded around by people, right? And the reason is basically because sort of houses don't produce cash flow, right? And it's kind of hard for somebody who owns nominally 1% of a house to sort of really exercise much of the rights associated with that ownership, right? And the trick in our system is sort of the government sort of prints this 10% every year, but you have an auction where in the end, somebody has to own 100%, right? Um, but sort of you use this printing to sort of dilute the stake of the owner and sort of um, reduce their incentives to hold out for high values rather than to sort of fractionate the stake of the asset. That's really not what this uh, design is trying to do. Yeah. Mm, got it. So you co-wrote this paper with Glenn Wilde and he wrote, he his book is amazing, his papers are amazing. He also has been talking a little bit of this thing called the cost model or the Harburger taxation model where you, you basically own 100% but every period you have to self-report what the value is and then you have to pay taxes, which is kind of like rental, short-term rental. So it's quite similar in, in the depreciating license model where you pretty much have a long-term incentive to want to invest, but also paying short-term rental fees to make sure that you are constantly being allocated the, the asset to you where you have the highest utility of it. So how would you compare against these two models? In fact, that's a really great question. Um... This paper is kind of old and sort of, I actually, Glenn and I actually started working on this paper um, very close to when Glenn and Eric Wasner started working on their um, early paper on Harvard licenses. So this paper used to be a quantitative model of Harvard licenses, right? Um, recently, we actually pivoted it slightly away from that, right? And then, so the primary difference has to do with sort of, you're entirely correct that many of the basic features of the two mechanisms are exactly the same. They're both designed to sort of trade off allocative and investment efficiency. They both do so by sort of creating these um, depreciation or self-assessed license fees, whatever you call those, which basically have the effect of limiting the owner's ability to hold out, right? The core difference is basically how do you determine this, self, this, this, this license fee payment, right? And then the Harberger model, this payment is determined by self-assessment, right? And so um, individuals announce how much they value the asset. So in our depreciating license model, these fees are determined in a auction. So a second price or an ascending auction. Now there's sort of benefits and trade-offs to each model. I think the benefit of an auction model is a, a critique that we got when we were talking about the um, self-assessment model is people were not happy about this kind of property of self-assessment that you might announce a price, um, hope nobody buys it, somebody buys it and you suddenly lose your house, right? So in, if instead you find a way to sort of calculate these fees using an auction, the auction at least has a kind of no regret property, right? In an ascending auction, you say you value your house this much. Somebody outbids you, 
you can match them and keep your house, but pay higher taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can sort of give up and sort of sell the house to them. So sort of, it's still possible that sort of somebody bids high enough that you find it in your interest to sell, right? But mm -hmm. you, won't, you won't sort of be surprised by losing your house, right? And so that's kind of the core mechanistic difference between the, D, the, the DL model and the Harbinger license model. And then sort of as a result, the game theory, the sort of um, price setting incentives are slightly different. So I'll just refer you to the paper for that. Um, but sort of, it has this nice property that you can assess the fees in an auction rather than using self-assessment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that, that completely makes sense because especially one of the, one of the issues that I had with self-assessing models is that because there might be a lot of other value that is involved in, let's say, pricing a house because it used to be my grandparents' house and really love it. I don't want to sell it. So I have a pri higher private value, which I have to add them in, into the system. We have to pay higher taxes based on my private value, which you don't necessarily have to in auction models with second price auction, that doesn't come into play. Yeah. So it's, at least it's priced more fairly, I would say. I would uh, sort of, that's one way to say it. I think sort of, there are cases in which the self-assessment may be desirable. If you have like relatively sophisticated um, firms, for example, participating, um, sort of, I think like how important this regret property is depends mm. kind of on the target audience, right? Mm. And so I think like there's space for both models. We haven't completely thought through um, which settings in practice one or the other is a better fit for, but I think they're like two alternative uh, mechanisms that sort of designers can play with and sort of implement and sort of um, time may tell us sort of which one works better. Yeah. yeah. So let's bring the conversation back to crypto for a little bit. So one, one example has been experimented by um, Simon Delaro. I don't really know how to pronounce his name. I feel so bad. And so he has this model. He has this, he experimented with this thing called the art is always on sale. So what it does, it uses the cost model where you buy the art and every time period, you have to self-assess the cost of it and pay some amount of taxes. He tried 5% taxes versus 100% taxes back to the artist. So that's an example of, it's kind of like licensing art because you kind of fully own the art, but also allows you to reallocate the art back to someone who has a like asset allocation. So how do you think depreciating licenses can be added into the crypto space or NFT space? So I think this is a really great application. I think sort of, you could almost literally take the model we're seeing and just apply it to NFTs, right? And I think like, let me contrast, let me um, draw one parallel, which is I think like things like this, I forget the reference, but things like this, I think have been tried in the art world before, even sort of before crypto, which is like, there was a desire at some point to make it so that artists would get paid when their art trades on the secondary market, right? And then so there were systems where people tried to write um, sort of legal constraints on artwork, which says whenever this is transacted on the secondary market, the original artist gets some percentage of the sale. Now, the issue with, oh, this was actually my original tweet thread, right? So sort of the issue with these systems is that distorts um, sales because you have a tax which is levied on sale, but not sort of when the artwork is not sold, right? That discourages people from selling the artwork, right? And then sort of relative to these systems, sort of harbinger licenses or depreciating licenses can be seen as a system which basically lets the artist keep a stake in the artwork, sort of, even after it's sold, right? And then sort of if an artist uh, sort of gets very famous and then sort of they still get sort of flow revenue from their earlier works, right? How you would implement it, I am not um, by any means a blockchain engineer, um, but sort of the implementation essentially requires some infrastructure to be able to run an auction and determine a price um, periodically, right? And then if you can organize an auction, then you can have bidders um, bidding for the license, right? And then given the price, sort of if the owner in the previous period was the highest bidder, she just pays the depreciation fee to the artist. And then if not, then the owner sells it to the buyer, some fraction of that goes to the artist, and then the, prop the ownership is transferred. So it's feel it seems like sort of, Implementation-wise, those are kind of the elements that you need in order to implement this, yeah. So when it comes to the use cases of crypto, other than NFTs, because I think this is a great use case if let's say we can embed different kind of licensing property rights. You know, instead of having a legal contract, it will be in a smart contract that will be executed automatically where it runs auction mechanisms every period instead of getting everyone together in the room to, make, to be bidding. The other use case that I was thinking about is because we talk about natural resources. So natural resources in the physical world, it's land and housing and spectrums. Natural resources or resources in the crypto world is, let's say, the bandwidth, 
in your layer one or layer two or having subset of validators just to be validating your semi-private or private blockchain, then could you be doing something like auctioning of different subsets of validators, especially your validator pools, and they can be paid, or they can be licensed, in the, and they validate only your specific kind of private blockchain transactions? I actually have not thought about this for, before. That's a very interesting idea. I think the basic idea behind these licensing formats is anything which is an economic rent, right? Is something that you can kind of assign property rights to, right? And then sort of anything which has that kind of property, I mean, which anything which somebody values for some reason is a persistent kind of asset, you could apply this to. So it kind of feels like there may be some intersection. I wasn't completely, not being sort of, into sort of crypto details to the extent where I totally understand these things. It feels like, take for example, the issue of sort of proof of work versus proof of stake, for example, mm -hmm. right? And the idea is somebody has to make decisions on sort of, um, sort of writing transactions in the blockchain, yeah. something like that, right? You can think of that as a source of rent, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can imagine a system, I'm just sort of totally brainstorming here, but you can imagine a system where sort of you design a license for that and you just auction that every period, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of that's one way to sort of, sort of in that sense, sort of anything which is a position of privileged sort of action mm -hmm. in the infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, you could imagine trying to sell it um, in this sense, right? And it will have some nice properties, which is that sort of, you can think of a depreciating license as sort of, it's a partial decaying property, right? So what does it ultimately do? You can keep it somewhat, but it's hard to keep it forever, right? Mm. So if you ever have a position where you want that property, so if we want people to, if you have the position today, have some chance of having it tomorrow, but you mm -hmm. simultaneously want to have the property that if you have it today, you can't keep it forever, right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps this kind of license could be a way of sort of navigating that trade-off. Now, I haven't thought about it at all. So then sort of... Um, We'll see where that line of thought goes, but I think that's a very interesting uh, potential application of this kind of thing. Yeah, seems like we're shifting to this business model where we are doing a lot of licensing of anything that adds value that you mentioned, and never yeah. ever owning a hundred percent of assets. So you look yeah. at Adobe subscription, Microsoft, Microsoft three six five, you're never ever owning an asset fully. Is that is that good or bad? I think that so in the framework of our little toy model of the world. Mm -hmm. This is a good thing, right? So in our framework of our little toy model, we show basically that um, if you go all the way to the extremes of like 100% ownership or 100% rental, that sort of is inefficient because of the fact that sort of you could get a lot more, say, investment welfare if you mm -hmm. went from the pure rental contract and added just a little bit of ownership, right? Yep. And vice versa, if you took pure ownership and added a little bit of rental, you could get a lot of wealth. So sort of mm -hmm. in, the, in our little toy model, your statement is exactly true, where we that we should always be somewhere in the middle. Now, of course, there's kind of like logistical, psychological costs where sort of perhaps the simplicity of not having to deal with these kinds of periodic auctions, even if they're almost sort of nominal, or they're really not sort of the probability of losing your asset is really small. That little friction may tip the scales in favor of a boundary solution of like 100% ownership or 0% rental. But you might think that sort of if technology sort of makes these auctions relatively seamless. And as people, I think, deal more with NFTs and these kinds of models where sort of they are more used to interacting with markets for personal property on relatively high frequencies, right? You might think that these kinds of frictional costs of participating in reallocation mechanisms decrease to the point where people are kind of relatively willing to entertain a model where sort of everything is like not 100% or 0% owned, but like somewhere in between. So maybe at some point in the future. Yeah. Very excited for that future. Okay. So if you have one advice that you can give to NFT developers using depreciating license in their model, what advice would you give? I think I have, that's a very good question. Um, do it and contact me. <laughs> so I'd be happy <laughs> to talk with anyone who is trying this. Um, and I think sort of, it's an interesting area because sort of, I think that a key principle of market design um, as an academic is that 
everything works well until you hit the real world and then a ton of stuff that you have never anticipated happens right and i think sort of this is still a young mechanism cost um also and depreciating licenses even more so and i think sort of a lot of the problems we may run into we just don't know yet and i think sort of i think what would benefit the space is if we have kind of people actually doing useful things, talking to theorists like me, and then sort of like drawing these connections between the sort of game theoretic models of the world and the applications. I honestly don't have a great guess on what the specific problems are going to be. But I think it's a very interesting space because sort of both the theory and the applications, like there's a rich intersection there. And so um, I'd be very excited basically to talk to anyone who's even just like early stage thinking about um, doing anything in this space. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a better answer than that. No, no worries. That's very good. Because I am looking to apply such models like this. I was thinking about a cost one for distribution rights, because that's part of property rights for books, because self-published books versus published, like books from publishing houses, they are both, they're, they're, they both have its pros and cons. And what we could do is to merge them together using different kind of tokenized mechanism to bring the best of both worlds together to deal with the risk adversity with publishing houses, but also the distribution network of self-publishing. And that's where a lot of property rights come into play. And I've been looking at property rights for some time now. I've developed a very simple model for it. And I and the initial idea is just to use a bonding curve to determine to, like you mentioned, where we think that governments can define the prices. But in these kind of private properties, especially when it crosses jurisdictions, it's quite hard to determine that. So having this kind of depreciating license in the licensing or property rights of distribution of the book will actually be quite fun and useful. So I'm definitely going to contact you on that because sure. yeah, because I'm having a lot of troubles with the current model anyway. So might as well just make it more complicated and then we'll go figure out how to develop them after. Um, yeah, we'd be excited to talk about that. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time, Anthony. And Thanks a lot. No, it was great. Talk. Yeah. I'll put your, I'll share your Twitter and I'll share your paper in the link below. Great. So anyone can just reach out to Anthony if you have any questions. Yeah, that's good. Thanks okay. a lot, Lisa. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.